Hello, I'm Brandon Butler, a second year PhD candidate at the University of Michigan in Professor Sharon Glatzer's lab. Today I'll be talking about Humdi Blue, specifically changes to our API in preparation for version 3, which is yet to be released. In the process, we will showcase developments that improve Humdi Blue's extensibility and interoperability with the scientific Python ecosystem. To begin, we will discuss the two flavors that particle simulations generally come in, molecular dynamics that evolves a system forward using Newton's equations of motion, and Monte Carlo, which uses a Markov chain to explore a system's phase space and find its equilibrium properties. Both these techniques were developed in the 1950s and since, have since become very common techniques used to study these kinds of systems. Today, many programs exist to perform these kinds of simulations, programs such as LAMPS, GROMAX, GOMC, Cassandra, OpenMM, MCCCS, MNTOHI, and Humdi Blue to name a few. Humdi Blue serves as a Python package for molecular dynamics and hard particle Monte Carlo simulations with a backend written in C++ and CUDA slash HIP for use on the GPUs and CPUs. And here you can see links to our GitHub repo, our official website, and our read the docs page. Humdi Blue is optimized for use on the GPUs and is the fastest GPU molecular dynamics and hard particle Monte Carlo simulation engine. Its Python interface provides a full programming environment, greatly increasing the potential for customization, and it has been used in at least 335 peer-reviewed publications as a simulation engine. It's been under active development since 2008, has 71 contributors on its master branch, has 100 stars on GitHub, uses a BSD3 clause license, and at the time of presenting, consists of over 1,400 files and 250,000 lines of code. Here we showcase different publications that have used Humdi Blue as a simulation engine to study things such as quasicrystals and hexatic phase transitions. Moving on into the performance aspect of Humdi Blue. Humdi Blue is designed to scale from a single core CPU to thousands of GPUs and everything in between. To showcase this, we'll go over the scaling both on CPU and GPU to some extent. For a CPU, we'll look at a Leonard Jones fluid of 64,000 particles at a number density of 0 0.328. And on the right, we're showing the strong scaling behavior across MPI ranks. So on the X axis, X axis represents MPI ranks, while the Y axis represents the hours it takes to run 10 million time steps. The orange line represents perfect strong scaling, while the blue diamonds represent the actual results obtained, which we can see are very close to perfect strong scaling. The dotted blue line on the bottom represents the performance of a single NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPU, which is over 100 times faster than eight cores on an Intel Xenon Gold processor, as we can see here. Now to back up the claim that Humdi Blue is performant across thousands of GPUs, we show here weak and strong scaling figures from a paper from 2015 that looks at Humdi Blue's GPU scaling. And as we can see on the x-axis, both these graphs go over, go over 1,000 GPUs. And in both cases, both in strong and weak scaling, we show, we show good scaling. The x-axis in this case is number of GPUs, and the y-axis in this case is time steps per second. So in this case, higher is better rather than lower, as in the previous example. Now, having shown Humdi Blue is performant, we'll go over the goals for version 3 and why we are creating it a version 3 to begin with. So modern simulations need performance, which Humdi Blue already offers, but they also need a great deal of customization and flexibility. Version 3 is seeking to increase the ability to customize and the flexibility the package offers. It desires to provide a more Pythonic API and integrate more fully with existing scientific Python packages. In addition to these aims, we wish to improve simulation transferability, reproducibility, usability, and extensibility of our simulations, also known as trueness, a term coined by Mosdef, which whom Deep Blue is a part of. We will now get into discussing Humdi Blue version 3 and its API.
Here we have an example script from both version 2 and version 3 of Humdi Blue that run a molecular dynamic simulation of Leonard Jones particle particles for 100,000 time steps. First, we create the simulation or simulation context. On the left, we can see that we don't actually store a reference to the object created. In version two, to present a familiar format to those used to other simulation engines, a quasi-global simulation context is maintained behind the scenes. Whereas in version three, we can see we explicitly create a simulation object. In Hootie Blue version three, we have favored this explicit model in order to make multiple simulations easier to run and also to make the architecture of a simulation easier to understand and visualize and see directly. We now create the system state. On the left, we can see once again, we're not creating a variable or a reference to the state object created, while on the right, we store the state directly in a simulation object we've already created. We now define the integrator thermostat and forces associated with our simulations. On the left, once again, these different operations automatically get added into that quasi-global state. While on the right, we can see that we build up at the bottom on line 21 and 22, this integrator object that contains the forces and methods that will be associated with our simulation. We now create different ways, different means of outputting data for later analysis and visualization. On the left, we create a GSD file and a log file. Now these are separate, whereas, whereas in version three on the right, we can see that we add this logger object to the GSD object. So this is a new change in version three. This GSD file output can now store log data. Or, which means that we can store particle positions along with potential energy within the same file. And finally, we run the simulation. On the left, we just call humd.run, and it runs that quasi-global state mentioned before. And on the right, we actually have to add the operations we wish to run in a given simulation before running it. And that can be seen here in lines 30 and 31 before we're calling run in line 34. Having, sh having shown an example script, we'll now go over the core objects that make up Humd Blue version three. They are the simulation, state, operations, and device classes. The blue boxes represent the various attributes and methods that are frequently or commonly used within these classes. The simulation object is like the world. It represents all, all of an simulation, including its data, operations, and setting, hence the name simulation. The device object connects the simulation to the real world. It determines the hardware the simulation runs on, the degree of parallelism, and things such as memory tracebacks and performance analysis. It's what lets you utilize supercomputers like Summit effectively. The state object holds all data or state relevant to the simulation. These, this includes data such as the simulation box, particle positions and velocities, bond, angle, and dihedral data, and other data associated with a simulation's state. And finally, we have operations. Now, if we think of the simulation state as, a, as the simulation's material, the operations class is much like an assembly line. Like an assembly line, the operations class gathers together and organizes individual workers, called operations, into a single object to act on some raw material to create a final product. The raw material here is the simulation state, and the final product is the evolution of that state using molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo. The operation class stores four different types of operations, analyzers, updaters, tuners, and integrators. Integrators are the core operation that evolves the system forward and are required for all Humdi Blue simulations. We can see the initialization of integrators both for version two and version three in the code snippets. Updaters update system state or modify it. 
In both these examples for both version 2 and version 3 of HoomD, we create a box resize updater, which allows the simulation box to change shape within a simulation according to given values that we, have, that we set beforehand. In version 2, we have to explicitly set for each degree of freedom the box, in this case, the x and y dimension. While in version 3, we just interpolate between two boxes that the user gives us. Also in version 3, we utilize the new <laughs> variant subclasses that allow us to change the behavior of that interpolation. Whereas in version 2, we can only linearly interpolate between values. In version 3, we can also offer, as can be seen here, cycling behavior. This box resize object would cycle between box 1 and box 2 every 200 time steps. We have analyzers, which analyze the current simulation state and write out data. In the code snippets taken from the example script shown previously, we can see the GSD and log objects from version 2, while in version 3 we see this logger object that can be plugged into the GSD object to create the same output. <laughs> and finally, we have tuners, which tune hyperparameters for performance. In version 2, this is not an existing concept, although some classes that do this kind of that have this kind of behavior do exist as updaters. In version 3, we show an example of the particle sorter, which sorts particles according to a Hilbert curve, which dramatically improves caching. Continuing, we will now discuss how you access data in, from a simulation. So the state offers its data in two primary ways. Through a global snapshot, which aggregates all data onto a root, the root MPI rank. This requires copying the data and gathering it onto a single MPI rank, which can be costly. However, you do have the benefit that all the simulation data is in one place. For this reason, you can set a simulation to an existing snapshot directly. And on the right, we also show that how you can modify a snapshot and then set it back to a state. So one caveat about setting an existing state to a new snapshot, this reinitializes all simulation data, which once again can be a little costly. However, it is easy to use. And there are times where the global snapshot is necessary and is the most useful way to access data. However, we do provide another mechanism for accessing data, the local snapshot, which tries to remove some of the limitations of the global snapshot. The local snapshot allows users to access directly Humdi Blue's internal data buffers on either the CPU or GPU, meaning they can modify them directly in Python. So on the code examples you can see here, they look very similar, in both on a CPU and GPU, and that's on purpose. The only change in this code necessary to change whether you're accessing data on a CPU or the GPU is to use CPU local snapshot versus GPU local snapshot. <laughs> the local snapshot offers this data only within the context manager for memory safety. But it gives you direct access to Humdi Blue's memory buffers on CPUs or GPUs. The buffers expose a NumPy-like interface on both CPU and GPU, meaning you can treat them just like you would treat a NumPy array for the most part. And they use the array interface and CUDA array interface protocol protocols for compatibility with external Python libraries such as PyTorch, Numba's G GPU just-in-time compiler, QPy, NumPy, SciPy, and others. And here is a table showing a brief comparison between these different types of data access. We will now discuss Humdi's logging facilities, which do not involve trees or chainsaws, but rather they involve the storing commonly in a text file of simulation data distinct from a trajectory file, or at least that's how logging was. Logging in Humdi Blue version 3 follows this data model. You take objects of a loggable class and they send their data to a logger. That logger then transforms that data into an intermediate representation that can then be consumed or used by different logging backends, such as GSD, CSV, or a given user backend, which 
GoHead already shows that users can create their own if they wish. Here we show the loggable meta class, which allows us to have that first part of the data model. The loggable meta class allows us to use a decorator-like syntax for whom the blue operations to specify quantities that are loggable. On the right, you can see here that we use loggable.log to specify that the energy, energies, and forces of a given force are loggable. The loggable automatically handles inheritance, so any class that inherits from force will also have these loggable quantities. Now, the logger object links classes of type loggable, or objects of classes of type loggable, to logging backends. So in version two, the way you logged was you had to know exactly what quantities you could log from objects you had previously created. Well, in version three, this logger object has ways of directly interfacing with loggable objects that allow you to specify, I want to specify what quantities you want to grab and also query what quantities are available. That's what can be seen in the version three snippet. Here we showcase some other features of the log logger class. Namely that you can limit the type of loggable quantities you want. In this case, we log we say we only want to log scalar quantities. We can choose what quantities of an object we wish to log, providing a list in the add quantity method. Or we can directly add all loggable quantities in, in a, a given object exposes using the plus equals operator. We can also log, log custom quantities, as can be seen at the bottom of the code example currently. As mentioned previously, we also allow different logger backends to exist. In this case, we have a standard out logger backend. This is all the code that's necessary to directly plug into Humd Blue to create a logger that will run on a given step that you decide and print out to standard out. <laughs> Providing a common output mechanism found in simulation engines. We will now move on to three different ways Humd Blue extends customization. First, we'll go over triggers, which control when an operation runs. On the right, we can see this periodic trigger object highlighted or emphasized which produces the behavior seen in version 2 of Humdi, which run, will allow an operation to run periodically, in this case, every 10 steps. However, we've added other ways to trigger operations, such as before, the before trigger, which will always run before a given time step, and the after trigger, which will run always after a given time step. Now, these on their own may not seem as useful, but triggers are now composable using logical operators. The AND trigger performs a N-way AND logical operator on a list of triggers and only returns true if all of the compo composing triggers also return true for a given time step. In this case, we create a trigger that is periodic but only after time step 100. <laughs> and the key feature of triggers are these are usable everywhere that an operation where are usable for every operation that does not run every single time step. In this case, updaters, analyzers, and tuners. But not only do we ha have we extended the feature within Humd Blue, we've also provided users a mechanism for creating their own. Using regular vanilla Python subclassing, you, users can create their own trigger objects that implement whatever behavior is necessary for the given simulation. This log trigger object, assuming you had a base of two, would run on steps one, two, four, eight, and 16, and so on. However, the a customization that can be done is limitless. You can use any arbitrary Python code and make the trigger stateful if necessary, which means you could trigger for instance, when a Q6 order parameter reaches a certain value. Going over the next example of Humd Blue's extensibility, we have variants, which allow us to interpolate between values over time. They allow quantities such as temperature, pressure, and box size to vary within a simulation. In Humd Blue version 2, 
we allowed linear interpolation, which can be seen in this like in this ramp example. However, in version three, we have expanded this concept into a variety of different behaviors, including cycle, which cycles between values, and power, which approaches a approaches a value from an initial value given some power. In this case, that power is cubic, so we are approaching to the power of three. However, like triggers, if the existing behavior necessary for a simulation doesn't exist, you can create it in Python. Here we create a sign variant that provides a sinusoidal cycling in these few lines of Python code on the left. And this is all that's required to to provide this behavior if you want to vary in this continuous manner, temperature or pressure or box size. The final means of customizing whom deep blues behavior we will go over is also the most powerful. And that is the customization of actions. Now actions are the logic behind operations that allows for them to do their functions, it allows for the GSD, file writer to write its output, it allows for the box resize to resize the box. And so allowing users to create their own actions effectively opens up the entire toolkit for them to create new functionality in Whomd. It allows for the execution of Python code in a simulations run loop, the use of performant Python packages, which along with the local snapshot API, allow for Python actions to be quite performant. And they act indistinguishably from Humpty Blue actions. In fact, some of our own internal actions that we use are written in pure Python. These custom actions can expose lockable quantities, they can set integrator flags, and they can also send an end signal to the simulation object to signal they are finished if they have some concept of completeness. Here I show an example of a custom action that implements a reaction-like move that allows particles to switch from an initial type to a final type at some specified rate. And these lines of code here are all that are necessary to allow for the simulation to, all that are necessary to allow for the simulation to run and create that reaction-like move. Here we show a video of this, where the purple particles you see, the deeper colored particles you see, are particles of type B. They're the final type in this action. And the cloud of particles you see initially are particles of type A. So the simulation starts off with no particles of type B, but as time progresses and the action is, is run, we see particles of type B start filling the simulation box. Now this is a fairly performant, <laughs> this code is also fairly performant, taking less than one one thousandth uh, of the time of the simulation, running every thousand time steps. In conclusion, Humdi Blue is a performant, scalable Python package for molecular dynamics and hard particle Monte Carlo simulations. With version 3, we offer an improved Pythonic API that emphasizes user customization. We also provide performant ways to interact directly with internal simulation data, allowing other packages to interface with Humdi Blue in a performant and seamless manner. I would like to thank all Humdi Blue contributors, past and present, a list of which can be seen below in the link below. I would like to thank the Glatzer Lab for all their help and support. I would like to thank the National Science Foundation for their funding. I'd like to thank NVIDIA for the hardware they provided for running, uh, for running and testing Whom Blue, and the Advanced Research Computing at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor for their computational resources and services. <laughs>